Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's CMMID seminar. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Emma Cockcroft, a postdoctoral research fellow from the University of Bern. Emma will be talking about the realization of real time tracking with SARS CoV 2 and what genetic epidemiology has uncovered about the virus' spread. She'll be take, uh, talking about her work at Nick Strain, as well as some of the challenges that Nick Strain, the Nick Strain project, has faced in displaying large amount of real-time data with unprecedented public attention. Thank you very much, Emma, for agreeing to speak today. Um, and Emma will be speaking for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will have time for audience questions. Please post your questions in the Q&A box during the talk, and we will try our best to get through them all before the seminar closes at 1.45 p.m. UK time. You are also able to vote for questions that you would like us to address first, um, but without much further ado, let's begin the seminar. Emma, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction and thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak here today. It's certainly an honor and I'm very excited to uh, have some, hopefully some good questions and discussion afterwards. So today I will be talking pretty much mostly about phylogenetics and SARS-CoV-2. Unfortunately, it will be a whistle-stop tour because there's been so much in the last year, I can't cover everything. But in particular, since this is a modeling seminar, I thought that it would also be interesting to talk about some of our most recent work that we actually have just finished working on this week for modeling alongside phylogenetics. But first, I wanted to just get started with a quick recap of exactly what phylogenetics is. So if we think about a pathogen moving through a population, let's say that this is a virus. And so here, the people who are infected are shown as the red dot. And the transmissions are these black lines leading from one person to the other. Now, as the virus moves through this population, it will acquire mutations. That's what viruses do. Now, it's important to remember that most of these won't change how the virus works, but they are essentially the bread crumbs that let us do phylogenetics. So here you can see them accumulating in the population. The other important thing to note is that of course, it's pretty rare that we get to sample everyone in a population that has that pathogen. And so here the people who have been sampled are shown as the blue circles with the letters inside of them. Now, another caveat for real life, of course, is that even when we sample people, they don't necessarily actually get sequenced. Um, that's a really kind of burdensome thing to do. But in this toy example, we're gonna say that we are able to sequence everyone that we sample. And when we do this, we extract the genetic material out of the virus that we've taken from these people. And of course, this gives us the viral genomes. And so you can see here, the virus genome is just represented by a straight line, but the mutations that are the same as the ones in the transmission process are shown as the same colored diamonds. And you can already start to see how we use these mutations to see how these sequences are related. Sequences with more shared mutations are more closely related, and those that don't share as many mutations are further apart. And so we can use algorithms, of course, in real life on a much bigger scale to start organizing this into what is essentially a virus family tree or a phylogeny. And this gives us a representation of the um, the original transmission process. Now, if, importantly, that's, that's approximate. Um, we aren't able to reconstruct everything exactly, in particular because we didn't sample everyone. But what we can see is the connections between the sequences, and we can see that branch legs help show us how many mutations different these sequences are from each other. Now, once we have this kind of original mutation tree, we can do some exciting things, like since we know when and where these samples were taken, we can actually incorporate this information into the tree. So for example, we can get time resolved trees where we actually plot the samples on the x axis of time when they were sampled. And then we can use algorithms to reconstruct back in time when these hypothetical ancestors existed. And so this can really help us in reconstructing the history of the virus. Now, on top of that, of course, we often know the location of where a virus was sampled. And so if we can, for example, color the tips here by different countries that a virus was sampled in, we can again reconstruct back in time where those hypothetical ancestors might have been. Now, of course, there's a lot of caveats to this work because it's really influenced by the sampling we have available, which is almost never complete. But more importantly, it can often be really biased. So for example, if we never have a sample from a country, the yellow country in this example, we're never gonna infer that the virus was there in the past. If we have very few samples from a country, we're gonna less like, we'll be less likely to infer that the virus was there in the past. So there's a lot of caveats we have to keep in mind. But in general, this is exactly the work that underlies what we do at NextStrain. Now, NextStrain, if you aren't familiar with it, I'd really encourage you to go check it out. 
you can go to nextstrain.org. And Nextstrain is both the website you'll see when you go to that URL, and it's the analysis software that actually underlies that and both does the phylogenetic analysis and then creates the beautiful um, visualizations that you'll see. And this is probably one of the things Nextstrain is most well known for, our kind of um, intuitive, innovative, and, and interactive interfaces. Now, Nextstrain's purpose is to track epidemics and pandemics in real time. Um, and we've actually, I think maybe because we've become a bit well known during the pandemic, it's maybe important to note we were around before the pandemic. We actually originally started in order to track flu, but we've been able to expand to do all sorts of pathogens. I'm just showing a handful here. But of course, that is the flu work that we're probably most famous for until most recently, I think most people associated with SARS-CoV-2. Now, one last important thing about NextStrain is that it's not an organization. It's just a collection of scientists who are employed at universities working on the NextStrain project. And all of our code and everything we do is open source. We try, we're really strong believers in kind of open science and open source. Now, of course, because NextStrain is such a big project, it is not something that any one person has done. It was co-founded by Trevor Bedford and Richard Nair. Most of the group is in the US where Trevor is based. There's a few of us here in Switzerland and James Hadfield is based in New Zealand. So we really are a global team. Now, we've been working hard, of course, the past year, primarily on SARS-CoV-2. And if you go to the NextStrain website today and click over to the SARS-CoV-2 build, you'll see something like this. So this is, a tree of the current samples um, in February 2021. And we have globally now over half a million sequences available of SARS-CoV-2, which is incredible when you think about we didn't, we haven't even known this pathogen exists for a little more than a year. Just to put that in comparison, before the pandemic, I worked on a virus called Enterovirus D68. We've known about that since 1962, and I had 800 full genomes. And I was really proud of that. That was like a good data set. But hopefully that kind of puts into contrast how amazing it is we have half a million genomes in a year or just over a year with SARS-CoV-2. And these have come, as hopefully you can see on the map, from countries all over the world. We have samples from over 120 countries, um, which is about half the countries in the world. But really importantly, that also means we don't have samples for every country. There are a lot missing. And even countries where we have samples, they may not be representative. So we may not have many samples or they may be really old from the early part of the pandemic so that we don't really know what's going on there now. And we do have to always keep this in mind when we're doing phylogenetics to see what, do what we can to correct those biases, but when we can't to make sure that we're keeping those in mind when we're interpreting our trees. Now you'll probably notice that the tree I'm showing here is not 500,000 sequences. There's a couple of reasons for this. So we run new builds every weekday. So we do need the builds to finish that day or we would forever be catching up with ourselves. Um, but also in a visualization, it's really hard to work with very, very big trees. It becomes really cumbersome, hard to tell what you click on. So we try and do representative downsampling. So our builds are about 4,000 sequences. Now, of course, as time has gone on, um, we literally just cannot capture everything when you're just sampling 4,000 out of 500,000. But we do have multiple builds to help with this. So we have a global build and then a build for each of six regions around the world, like North America, Africa, Europe, et cetera. And so this does help to focus in a little bit more. But importantly, many people outside of the official NextStrain builds, uh, both people on the NextStrain team, but also labs all around the world are running their own builds for their own countries, their own regions, their own states, their own cities. And we actually have, if you go to nextstrain.org and you go to the SARS-CoV-2 page, we have a map where you can see all of these builds. So it's often possible to drill down even further and get a really good look at a specific area, which particularly since travel is a lot less than it used to be, is often one of the most useful kind of views of the pandemic right now. But I want to jump straight into kind of what it actually, you know, I've made this beautiful tree. It looks great. It would, you know, make wonderful artwork on your wall. But what can we actually use phylogenetics for, um, kind of real-time phylogenetics for SARS-CoV-2? Now, there's so many examples here, and I don't have time to, to detail all of them. So I'm just going to hit a few. So one of, I think, the most interesting things uh, with, with phylogenetics and SARS-CoV-2 came very early in the pandemic. So if we rewind the clock to over a year ago, 26th of January, 2020, I had to go through and add years to all these slides now. That wasn't a problem the last time I gave these talks. Um, this was the data we had available at the end of January, 2020. So these were all the sequences, not very many. And I'm actually showing the same tree here, just two different views. So this is exactly the same sequences you'll notice. On the, on the right here, I'm showing what's called mutation view. That's that initial tree I showed up at, uh, flashed up at the beginning of the talk, where essentially we're just using the mutation information from the viruses, not the date, not the location. And we're just showing 
here at the x-axis is the mutations, and we're just showing how different or similar the sequences are in numbers of mutations. Now, the other view we can do is that second tree that I showed, so the time-resolved view. So here on the x-axis is time, and we've plotted the samples by the date that they were taken. Then our algorithms try and go back in time and try and reconstruct the potential history, the kind of possible history of these, um, of these viruses. Now, we always have to be really careful with these reconstructions, and I actually think this is a great example, because if you look at these top two sequences, you'll see that they're genetically identical. There's no information here to kind of tell them apart. But our algorithms have tried to kind of put some time on this and they've drawn some, some random branches here. If we just took this tree, we might think that there was information that linked, for example, these two sequences more closely together. But at least from the genetic data, that's not true. So this is a good example of why we have to be really careful and use both views when we're interrogating phylogenetic trees. Now, the other things we can see are really important from a pandemic point of view, though. One thing that's really striking here is the lack of diversity. So in all of these sequences, you can see that they're really very similar to each other. A lot of them are identical. So these ones are identical, these ones are identical. Anything that sits on the same vertical line is identical. And then even those that aren't identical are separated by one or a couple mutations essentially on average. Now, what this means is that the virus is, is relatively young. It hasn't been circulating in humans that long. We know that the virus mutates at about two mutations per genome per month. And so if it had been in humans longer, we would expect to see more diversity, more differences between these sequences. That lack of diversity also tells us something about the number of introductions that the virus likely had into humans. So for example, if this was circulating in an animal reservoir, it would be diversifying there. And then if it jumped up from you know, one jump here and one jump here from the animal reservoir, then when we sampled those humans, we would see that their viruses, again, were more diverse, were more far apart because they had that diversification in the animal reservoir. So this is both pointing to that this is a recent jump and it was probably a single jump, or at least what came, became the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was the result of just one jump. The final thing that we can see is that there aren't many sequences here that don't come from China, but there are a couple here in the middle from the USA, and we can see that they nest really well within the diversity of the rest of the samples that are from China and from Asia. And what this tells us, uh, even though there's just two here, we see this continue over the next few weeks as we see more and more um, you know, non-Chinese samples, this tells us that the, the origin of the virus was very most likely China because other sequences nest within that Chinese diversity. And so that's a really classic signature of being able to see kind of where was the origin and where are things moving out of that more diverse pool. Now, one of the other things we were really interested in the earlier days of the pandemic was telling the difference between importation versus local transmission. So if you can cast your mind back, um, you know, back to those, those early days, February and March, countries were picking up cases of SARS-CoV-2, but particularly since our sampling and our testing often focused on travelers, these were often cases where the virus had been brought back to the country from someone coming from, from China or from Asia. And the hope was is that these, these were caught and kind of quarantined quarantine quickly enough, then hopefully they wouldn't spread within the community. But we were looking out for signs of local transmission, which means, you know, it's spreading from person to person in your community. It's not just being imported from somewhere else. So I think we can see a really good example of this. If we go forward in time just a little bit to the 20th of February, 2020, uh, 28th of February 2020, so not far from where we are in this year. This is a tree, we can see, you can see we have more samples, but I've actually filtered the tree so that we can only see samples from the USA. The, uh, the samples from other countries are kind of hidden in these skinny lines. And what we see here is a really classic picture of importations. So there's a more diverse circulation of the virus in China and probably now in other parts of the world too. And that's spilling over, it's being introduced into the US in all of these individual events. And so we can see this here because most of the US samples, they're, they're scattered through the tree. They're kind of a random sampling of what's circulating in China or in Asia. And there's very few that cluster together. And those that do were usually, you know, like two people who travel together, for example. So this is a very classic kind of importation looking on a tree. But if we fast forward just about a week later to the 7th of March, we can see there's been a change in the tree. There's a very distinct cluster right here, a very closely related, a lot of these were actually identical sequences. And this is the somewhat famous um, Seattle flu study situation. So researchers in Seattle were testing people in the community for to better understand how, how flu was circulating. And they started testing those tests also for SARS-CoV-2, against CDC guidelines at the time. 
Now, when they did that, they did find SARS-CoV-2, but they also, this was in people that had no travel history, they had no connection with other known SARS-CoV-2 cases. But more importantly, when they put them in the phylogeny, this is how they group. They were all incredibly closely related. And what this indicates is that it wasn't that these people were lying about their travel history or had you know, unknowingly been in contact with someone else who had a travel history. These really were ongoing local transmissions that were connected to each other in the community. And this was one of the first indications that this was spreading locally in the US. So many scientists did think this was probably happening. This was really proof that it was happening. Now we've relived this a little bit. You might already be thinking in the last month or two with the new variants of concern, in particular, the B117 or 501YV1 coming from the UK. Um, once again, we have been looking at trees that are very similar to see where has the variant, where have the variants of concern traveled to and are they spreading locally? So this is just a little bit earlier this month, 2nd of February, 2021. This is a tree from the Netherlands at that time. And again, we can see the same pattern here. We see a bunch, this is, sorry, this is the, the, the cluster of the tree that's the B117 lineage. And you can see many separate events here that often a lot of these will indicate independent introductions, but we can see a really big cluster here. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but if you zoom in, it becomes very clear. This is ongoing local transmission. And of course, we know now that this is happening you know, pretty widely across Europe and in many other countries as well, but particularly in January, this was a big question. You know, has, has B117 left the UK? How much and is it spreading locally? And pretty much now we can say with some confidence that the answer is yes. Now, of course, as the trees have gotten bigger, it's not only, you know, the, the big tree itself and the variants of concern we want to talk about, but we also often want to talk about different parts of the tree and how they've changed over time. So as the tree has grown, we've identified what we call clades in the tree and given these names to try and make them easier to talk about. Now, this is something else that's been in the media recently because, of course, there's been some, some discussion about nomenclature and how we should name things. And there are generally two different systems that are widely used. But in next strain, our purpose is that we are trying to identify really big significant kind of features in the tree. So we're not trying to label um, more kind of small local things, which is what pangolin is really good for. And it has a kind of different use case. But at next strain, we're looking at kind of the bigger, longer term evolutionary picture and trying to help break up the tree into kind of significant chunks. And our naming system is pretty simple. Essentially, it's the year that we think it, it diverged or that we identified it. And then we just label A, B, and C. So this gives you some information about when it kind of popped up and then when in the year it popped up or at least what order it popped up in the year. So we have things like 19A, 20B, 20C, et cetera. And then we also do give names for the variants of concern. Anything announced is a variant of concern. So they get both the letter system, so 20I, and then a slash to kind of indicate the, the mutation. And in this case, since, since the three variants of concern all have 501, we've, we've called them V1, V2, and V3, just in the order that they were identified. Now, another thing we can do with these kind of cool graphs, you can see here how different clades have risen and shrunk over time and the rise of the B11, this is the B117 lineage. We can see how this has changed over time. We can do the same thing with mutations. So just to use a really famous one as an example, this is the D614G mutation. We heard about it in the summer, but it actually arose really early in the pandemic, maybe January or February of 2020. And it has become by far and away the most prevalent kind of uh, a lineage, all of these that, that came from this small descendant here. These, this is by far the most prevalent variant circulating right now. You can see it's really kind of shoved out the D, the D variants. And so this also reminds us that we can use phylogenies to track variants and to track mutations, which I think at the moment, this argument is a lot easier to make with the variants of concern, but I wanna really emphasize that it's not just variants of concern that can be really useful and teach us things about the pandemic and about SARS-CoV-2 and especially about how it spreads. So just as an example, here's a couple of screenshots from a site co called covariance.org that I managed to track mutations and variants. And here I've listed a few variants slash mutations that actually a lot of these, few of these will be featured in the talk. Now, um, these aren't variants of concern. You probably won't hear much about them in the media, 
But you can see how complex the kind of rainbow of variants, these are just two countries in Europe that I've picked out. You can see the different variants that have risen, have fallen, have changed. And of course, every country has a slightly different picture of their kind of variant profile. Now, a lot of these, we don't have any indication that they're more transmissible or that they evade immunity or vaccines, but they can teach us a lot about how the virus is moving because we, we can track them so easily. You know, they have these unique mutations and we can follow them, how they move between different countries and how they change over time. So that's exactly when I spent, what I wanna spend kind of the second half of the talk today talking about is our adventures in tracking one particular variant. It's gonna be EU1 here at the top in orange um, over the summer in Europe. And this is out now as a preprint. Uh, first came out in October. Uh, we updated in November. We've actually just submitted some revisions uh, this week. And so another preprint will be up soon, but it hasn't happened yet. But everything I cover in this talk will be included in the update. You can get to the preprint from, oops, from, from that URL there at the top. And I, I do want to start out by thanking our many co-authors. This was by far a group effort, and it has been a absolute pleasure to work with all of these many people. They've all contributed and they've made this process not only smooth, but also enjoyable. It's truly a blessing when you get a great team of co-authors to work with. So I definitely want to recognize all of their efforts for such a diverse and interesting paper. Now, as I said, we first pre-printed this in October and it actually got a fair amount of press attention in Europe with announcements of a new coronavirus that had spread across Europe, was being spread by travelers. Um, but I want to get into a little bit more detail of kind of how we saw this and our more recent updates on following why we think that this was transmission, sorry, was travel rather than transmission advantage. So this is a tree from including data up to the 30th of November. So uh, this covers kind of the summer and the early autumn, but it doesn't get into the, you know, things get a little bit more, more complex once the variants of concern started emerging and circulating. So we're drawing the line at 30th of November so we can focus on the summer dynamics in particular in Europe. And you can see that really um, E1, the one that we'll be focusing on here in, in, in this talk, has this mutation at position 222 in spike. And it really was one of the most most prevalent lineages, certainly of the kind of more distinct lineages, not the older lineages, it became the prevalent lineage in um, uh, Western Europe um, by the course of the summer. I think at the end of kind of if we just looked at the end of November, EU1 cases were about 50% um, of cases in Eastern Europe by then. And you can really see how prevalent this is, all of the orange scattered across this map. And these pie charts are, are actually covering all, all time, so the whole of 2020. So even though this only popped up in the summer, you can see what a significant kind of impact um, EU1 had on many, many countries, particularly in Western Europe. And we can actually look at the rise of EU1 by plotting the frequency or the proportion of sequences. So every week we get sequences, well, not every week, every day we get sequences from every country, but we plot it by week, the number of new sequences that come in from a country, how many of those fall within that EU1 cluster. So here we've done that for a few countries across Europe. And what you can see straight away is that this rise first took place in Spain. So you can see that kind of from, from late May, early June, it kind of EU1 kind of took off quite quickly and got to about 50% prevalence fairly, fairly speedily, but it continued to increase until it took up about 80 to 90% of cases in Spain or sequences from Spain were EU1. Now, it took a little bit longer, significantly, here's when Spain opened the borders. This is essentially also the time when travel resumed across Europe, and a lot of countries, you know, allowed people to travel around Europe without quarantine. And soon after that, we start to see EU1 appearing in many different countries across Europe. This is not a complete list, just a representative list, and rising in frequency. Now, we do see some differences in the dynamics here. So in France, for example, it rises, but it, it plateaus fairly low. It was only ever about 12, 15% of sequences in France. France. On the other hand, in Ireland, it gets up to 80%, almost as high as Spain, even though it didn't, we don't, we don't think, you know, it, it didn't originate in Ireland, but it really took off and grew here. We also see different dynamics, for example, in Norway, it seems like there was an early introduction that spread quite rapidly, but it was also brought under control, possibly by really good track and trace systems. And they actually seem to have gotten rid of EU1, but it reappeared again sometime in September and grew again to kind of an intermediate frequency. We also have, of course, uh, kind of deviations between whether countries settled at a higher percentage of EU1 or kind of a middling percentage of EU1, as well as the low ones like France. Now, this tree that I'm going to show next is a little bit confusing, but we'll, we'll walk through it. 
So this is a tree that just covers sequences through the 30th of September. This is to focus on kind of just the summer and to the tree just gets really complicated the more the kind of the longer the date goes. So we're trying to keep it simple here. And we've also just focused on a few highlighted countries. You'll see that gray is other, again, to try and keep this graphic a little simpler. And what this essentially is, is this is a tree of EU1, but it's a collapsed phylogeny. So essentially, if we take kind of this branch here, this has both Spanish and uh, UK sequences in it. And what we've done is where this, where the branch, where the sequences were just from one country, we've essentially collapsed these down into a pie chart. So this shows us that this genotype plus things that descended from this genotype but didn't leave that country are represented by one circle. So we're reducing the complexity of the trees. And essentially the bottom line is that it shows us the genotypes that are shared between countries. And one of the main takeaways here essentially is look at how much red is on the tree. Red is Spain. And particularly from the base, we can see there's a lot of diversity in Spain. And in particular, this diversity in Spain is shared across many, many, many other countries in Europe. And so this is a really strong signal that yes, this originated in Spain, or at least it, it expanded and grew up first in Europe and Spain, and then it spread from Spain to other countries. And we can see that, you know, this is, these were not just shared with one or two other countries, but with many, many other countries. The other thing we can see is that there's a difference in kind of the number and type of introductions. So for example, uh, the United Kingdom is in this kind of denim blue, and you can see that it's found pretty much across the tree. There were a lot of introductions, uh, or a lot of instances of this Spanish diversity popping up in the UK in the early part of summer and, and autumn, or sorry, in the late part of summer and autumn. Now, on the other hand, if we look at, for example, Iceland, there's actually just a couple of circles here that are this dark blue, showing that Iceland did did not have so many introductions. And in particular, essentially most of their EU1 outbreak came from one introduction here that really, really grew. The same is true for Norway. Norway is the salmon pink, and it actually only appears in this um, one circle. So it had one introduction that grew into that initial hump that I showed you on the previous graph. So this does tell us a little bit about some of the differences between countries and the proposed origin of the virus, of, of this variant. Now, I think certainly if you're thinking like we were thinking when we first noticed these dynamics, I think the first thing that pops into your head is, oh my gosh, is this mutation more transmissible? Is this, you know, should we be running to the WHO this second? What's going on? But fairly quickly as we started looking into this in more detail, we realized not necessarily. We did think that there were other things that could explain the patterns that we were seeing. Now, we did some lab work as well that we do think actually also shows that this, uh, this 222 mutation in spike, which is really the significant mutation in, in EU1, it is pretty much indistinguishable um, from viruses, pseudotype lentiviruses that don't carry this, both in antigenicity and in kind of a titer test to look for, excuse me, to look for the presence of the virus. Um, I'm, I'm not going to cover that here. Um, it's it's a lot of fancy graphs that essentially tell you that there's no difference, but it is, a, it is in the preprint if you want to look at it in more detail. But even without doing the lab work, I think we can make, I mean, that's a very important part of the work, but I think we can make a pretty convincing case for why we think this was mainly um, travel rather than a transmission advantage. So for, for example, the first thing we know is that the prevalence in Europe, so this is the prevalence of, of SARS-CoV-2 in Europe over the summer, and you can see that it's coming down nicely through the spring. It actually gets pretty low in June and, and early July, but it starts to rise in Spain and a little bit so in Belgium, but particularly in Spain, it starts to rise considerably earlier than other countries in Europe. You can really see the gap here between the other countries and Spain. So at the beginning of July, just after borders had opened and travel resumes, incidence in Spain is going up. We also know that along with that rise in incidence, there's a rise in travel. So this is the departures from Spain, um, you know, uh, uh, scaled to the population size of the home country for a few countries in Europe, and you can pretty much tell exactly when the borders open and travel became possible, a huge jump in travel, and then that starts to tail off. A few countries put in different restrictions at different times because of the rising incidents in Spain. A few didn't, but travel starts to tail off kind of exactly when we would expect when schools start again and the kind of traditional summer holiday period is over. Now, one thing I do want to point out about this graph is that during this time, there were different regulations on traveling to countries like Spain. So some countries did impose 
quarantine, you know, in, in late July or in August. Other countries never had a quarantine requirement. And some countries actually had a quarantine requirement the whole time. So Ireland never allowed quarantine free travel to Spain, but you would not know it from looking at this graph. And so I think that it's also a kind of an important reminder to, to keep in mind that even when we have procedures in place that in theory should be protecting us, we need to make sure. Now, I'm not trying to say that these, none of these people quarantined when they came back. I think a lot of them did. But is it working the way that we think it's working? Is it as being as effective as we think it is? Remember that Ireland got up to 80% EU1 um, by, the, by the kind of end of, of autumn. Some of that introduction was likely from the UK that also had very high incidence, but I think it is a really important reminder that it's not just putting the rules in place, it's making sure that they're having the effect that we think that they have or that they should have effectively and that everyone's able to adhere to them because that's not always very equal either. Now, what we can do with these two graphs, though, is we can actually take the average incidence. We actually know this per Spanish province over time, so we can get a good idea of exactly what the SARS-CoV-2 incidence was in different places in Spain over time. And we can combine this. We actually have roaming data from Spain so that we know how many people were in Spain and which countries they came from. That's actually available. Of course, it's very anonymized. We have this at the province level, so we know who from which countries was where in Spain at what time. And combining these these two, we can actually estimate the number of introductions back to people's home countries um, over time because we know the prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 in each of the provenance. We know what countries were in which, in which provinces when, when they went back to their home country. So we can estimate the number of introductions of EU1 over time from Spain. And then we can finally combine this with what we know about the local epidemic growth in the home country. So we can look at case numbers week on week to see how that was changing. And we can predict uh, um, kind of how both E1 and non-E1 variants were changing in frequency over time. And essentially what this gives us is a very simplified model, but a model that shows us the predicted frequency of E1 in each of these countries over time. Now, what you can see well in the model is that it does show this, this increase kind of from the end of June, beginning of July, where travel resumes and we see that the number of E1, the, the frequency of E1 starts going up and then it starts to plateau. And this echoes pretty well the dynamics that we see in our observed graph. But if I put those side by side, I think I won't be shocking anyone to say that sure, the dynamics are okay, but the scales are quite different. So here, we actually match one very well. France here gets up to about 12% in our simple model, and it's about 12% in our observed graph. But that's about the only good match you'll find here for the scale. For other countries, you know, the UK, for example, it's at about 5%. And of course, in reality, it got up to about 60%. So why, um, why is our model not accurately predicting the frequency, even if it's getting the dynamics pretty good? We can actually look at this in more detail by plotting. So here, the observed numbers are now the dots again. So this is the actual observed frequency. And this, the, the solid lines are the, what the model predicts, but we've scaled it up. So we've, we've given a multiplier to try and get it to match what we observe. And what we notice here is that, as I already showed, showed you, for France, we've got it pretty much spot on. We're not off by a lot. For other countries, we're off by a bit. So for Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, we're off by a factor of about two or three. For another set of countries, we are way off. We're off by somewhere between seven and 11 times. We have to multiply our model to get it to match um, the observed frequency. So why are we having this discrepancy? And maybe just as importantly, why is it different in different places? We aren't off by as much in every country in Europe. So one really important thing we found when we looked at the roaming data is that different countries have very different preferences and where they like to go in Spain. So just to pull out two examples, visitors from France, presumably they often drive to Spain, they have that luxury. And so they often stick close to the border and they visit a lot of kind of, um, they kind of disperse across the, the top of Spain and perhaps are visiting maybe less well-known Northern areas in Spain. On the other hand, visitors from the UK have the, the hit list of places that we all know about from travel adverts. They like to go to Ibiza, Benidorm, Mallorca, Malaga, Tenerife, very different areas that, to, that, that they visit that people in, um, in France. And we can actually see that there's very, uh, very distinct differences in preferences of where people like to go. This is a really simplified way of trying to capture that, but it's just illustrative to show that, for example, where people in Switzerland go is not at all similar to where people in Denmark or the UK go, whereas there's actually overlap between, for example, Denmark and, and the United Kingdom and Denmark and Ireland as far as places that people visit. And what this implies is that 
um, the province, so the first thing is the province level may not be sufficiently capturing incidence differences. So we know incidents across a province, but people are often going to a very specific place in that province. They're going to a town, a resort, or even an area of a town. And the incidents in that very smaller area might be pretty different from the province as a whole. There's also a chance, of course, that these locations correlate with different activities and environments. You know, what you might be doing if you're visiting the mountainous region of Spain might be very different than if you're on the beaches. And things like going to a restaurant are obviously very different if the restaurant is crowded or if it's more empty. And none of this is being captured in our model. So is there a way that we can have a look and kind of see, you know, is our model accurately predicting the incidence of travelers who are returning? And we can actually look at this in just a couple of cases. So for example, in Germany, the government actually has records on cases asking people, you know, is this case associated with travel? And these are the number of cases in orange that they've recorded as being associated with travel from Spain. And in blue is our model estimate. And you can see that our model is way underestimating the number of introductions from Spain to Germany. Um, so our model is, is likely underestimating the chance that travelers are coming back with EU1. And this is, um, this is probably explained by a couple of things, but for example, one thing that might be playing into this um, is, is, is the reasons that I gave before. So for example, you know, prevalence may not be captured on a regional level, but also another thing that our model might be underestimating is kind of onward transmission. So, um, and, and kind of travel related behavior. So travel itself might be associated with, you know, a higher risk of, of getting SARS-CoV-2. You know, you're sitting close to people, you're on buses, you're on planes, uh, maybe in environments you're not used to, maybe not able to take your normal, you know, social distancing procedures. But also, for example, in Switzerland, they also have information um, not quite as complete as for Germany, but we do know the age of cases that were associated with travel to Spain versus cases acquired in Switzerland. And we can see that people who report their infection as possibly coming from Spain are significantly, or maybe not significantly, but are younger than people who say that they got their, their SARS-CoV-2 in Switzerland. Um, and so we know that younger people have more contacts and they may have other behavioral differences. And so I think that this is starting to outline some of the things, you know, they aren't in our model. It's a simple model, but this could explain why SARS-CoV-2, uh, why we're, we're underestimating EU1 in people returning from Spain and why we might also be kind of underestimating how EU1 might be spreading when people get back, particularly if it's in younger people with more contacts or that, you know, different behaviors related to travel mean that that onward transmission might take off. Of course, we would expect this to decay pretty quickly once people got back and it started spreading into the rest of the population, but it might explain how EU1 started to get a foothold in some of these countries across Europe. But there's something else that our model isn't capturing, and you might have noticed this, that in a few countries, there either seems to be kind of a second increase um, in the autumn, or in the case of Sweden, they're just kind of delayed and their whole increase seems to take place in the autumn. And one thing that our model is also not capturing is um, introductions from outside of Spain. So from countries that aren't Spain. And actually when we try and estimate um, the, excuse me, the case numbers over time of uh, EU1 and non-EU1 SARS-CoV-2. So here EU1 in Spain is the solid, um, uh, sorry, EU1 in Spain is the solid red line and E1 outside of Spain is the solid black line. And you can see that sometime in about mid-September, um, there's actually more E1 cases outside of Spain than in Spain. And of course, this is at a time when at this point, there were probably, well, there were travel restrictions to Spain for a lot of countries, but not to other countries in Europe. So for example, there might be a travel limitation on going to Spain, but not to the Netherlands or not to Norway. But of course, the incidence of EU1 has now increased in these other countries. So essentially, countries can kind of start playing swaps with EU1 with each other. Um, and this was kind of perhaps uh, an unknown risk that this was now happening between other countries. We can actually see some signs of this in the tree when we look for this. We can see that some of the later diversity in countries, especially, especially um, countries that seem to have the second increase, some of this really does link to other European countries, not necessarily to Spain. But we haven't investigated this in detail for each country. So just to summarize um, what we see with this EU1 um, paper and what we see with this, with this uh, study, 
we don't see any clear lab-based evidence that there's uh, the impact of this mutation has on, on transmission or antibodies. And instead, we do think this can be explained by travel. And in particular, we can use the phylogenetics and the rise in the frequency of EU1 to show over time how it spread initially from Spain, expanded within Spain, spread out of Spain, and then later on in the pandemic, we do think it started, sorry, later on in the season, we do think it started to spread between other countries in Europe as the incidence of EU1 in these countries rose quite high, but travel restrictions hadn't really caught up, it's very likely that EU1 was getting exported between non-Spanish countries. Now, our simple model isn't perfect. There's a reason I keep calling it the simple model, but it does approximate the dynamics well. And I think we can understand its limitations when we look at some of the other data that we have. So for example, we can tell that it underestimates um, the expected incidence of EU1 among travelers, probably because it's not capturing those more kind of intimate um, dynamics. For example, that the, 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 the incidence of SARS-CoV-2 may be different in individual towns or behaviors associated with those places versus the province as a whole. It's also not capturing introductions from non-Spanish countries later in the season, and it doesn't capture anything about behavioral age differences between people who've traveled um, and, and people who haven't, and how that may have influenced EU1 perhaps having travel advantages that non-EU1 didn't, but that are not linked to anything about the virus itself at all. So all of this, I think, really helped us show that EU1 came to dominate primarily through travel and associated factors, but not through a transmission difference. But as well as this kind of, you know, epi take, this, this modeling, this phylogeny, what's the kind of public health takeaway that we can get from this? And I actually think that's really important because I think what EU1 is a great illustration of is, is some of the failures in the travel system over the summer. And these are important to, you know, inspect and be honest about if we want to have travel again in the future, we need to know how things didn't work or did work in the past. So for example, even though the incidence was rising in Spain, um, governments still allowed people to travel, you know, incidents started going up in June and July in Spain, but people were still able to travel there. Governments were hesitant to put in quarantine or travel bans again. When people came back to their home countries, most countries did not have any testing in place. There was very little screening at the border. People had no idea if they had SARS-CoV-2 when they came home. Only a few places even offered testing. Um, and then, of course, even when it did come back, if it did come back to a home country and start spreading, what we would hope is that test and trace would be strong enough that it would be able to cut those transmission chains off quite quickly so that it couldn't get a foothold. But we don't see that happening. Instead, it was able to get, I mean, in some countries, really a hell of a foothold and, and spread quite effectively. Now, again, we know that there were quarantine requirements in, in many countries across Europe eventually, but we just don't think that, nest, that these maybe worked as we had imagined. And I think all of this really shows us, for one, you know, travel imports can impact epidemics. I think this is a really strong thing now. And it's really important if we want you know, countries to be thinking about travel for the future. And tracking variants is important, not just variants of concern. We need to understand also about how SARS-CoV-2 can spread and variants that aren't necessarily more transmissible can still teach us about this. And I think maybe the biggest takeaway is that you know, we, we see a lot of attention on variants here, a lot of attention on variants of concern. And I think it's really only natural that when people see a variant rising these days, the first thought is, is it more transmissible? Does it have an immune impact? But actually what we can see with EU1 really clearly is that you don't need a viral change necessarily to become incredibly prevalent. EU1 essentially took over Western Europe and we have no indication it was more transmissible. So I think we, we need to not underestimate the impact of our behavior and our restrictions on what, you know, what can spread in our pandemic and the impact this has on you know, both good and bad. So we can spread variants, but we can also stop variants with our behavior. And we need to be very careful that we have proof that there's a viral change before we conclude things are more transmissible and make sure that it's not the power of human behavior. Just to very quickly flash through kind of the other things that I think we, we've, we've done, well, the many other things we've accomplished with phylogenetics. Early in the pandemic, as I showed you, it can help us see that the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is recent in humans and it came from one source, emerged from China and spread throughout the world, and that it helps us to see this change from imports to local transmission, both early in the pandemic and with the more recent variants of concern. 
Later on, it's helped us to understand that early spread better. It's helped us to see how travel impacts epidemics as I covered in detail and, and how it can help us track variants. And of course, at the moment, a lot of the effort is on tracking variants, identifying mutations and their impacts. And thankfully, a lot of attention is coming now to the importance of things like sequencing and genomic surveillance. But we could still use a lot more of this in a lot of places in the world. And importantly, we also need the expertise to interpret that data. So with that, I'm just going to finish by flashing up um, an, kind of an ad for covariance.org, which is a website I manage. Features a lot of the features E1 that you've heard a lot about today, but also some other variants that we also saw over the summer, plus the variants of concern listed under their, their, their kind of most common mutation. And you can see a lot more information about kind of what's in each country and how dynamics of variants have changed over time. And with that, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. I hope this talk has been interesting and informative, and I'm happy to answer any questions that might be, uh, that might be lingering and have sufficient upvotes. Thank you so much, Emma, for your brilliant overview of your research and your experience working with real-time data in the Nick String project. Um, we actually have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, and um, we, I, I guess to start, perhaps a question from Sam, which is more of a clarifying question. Um, do the bills run each day? I think this is in the earlier part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, do the bills run each day? We build the whole tree, or do they take the last tree at some point and build it from there? And if it's a former, is it motivated by approaches currently available and are online? Um, or methods in development. Perhaps this can be done. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Oh, oh, the camera. Okay, there we go. I went blurry there for a second. Uh, this is a great question. And the answer is yes, we do build from scratch every weekday. We were actually doing every day, but in about May, we decided that our poor build shepherds, we call them, deserve to have weekends too. So now they get weekends. Um, but we do build every day and we do build from scratch because we actually pull in new information off of GIS-8 every day. And that can include updates both to the sequences and to the metadata. So we wanna be sure and capture all of that every time that we run. We get, I mean, up to 10,000 sequences a day these days. So it's pretty significant. So we do build that from scratch, but the entire pipeline is online. If you go to uh, github.com slash nextstrain slash ncov. So it used to be called ncov back in the day. You can see the whole pipeline. You can see exactly how we do it. It's all open source. We've just introduced a new tool made by Richard Nair and, and Yvonne that actually does the alignment. It's called NextAlign. And you can, that was the most computational kind of intensive step for a lot of people. Aligning half a million sequences is no small feat. Um, yeah. And that can now be done much faster and much more memory efficiently on, on even on a laptop. So it is something that you can replicate if you're interested in. Yeah, thank you. All right, so I think another question from um, Brooks Minor. Under a most ideal viral sampling sequencing program, do you think phylogenetics and other tools but no lab work would have ever been, uh, would we ever been able to confidently discern whether the rise of a clade or mutation is the result of selection virus uh, versus drift? So. I guess making the lab work to ground truth be comparatively less important. What do you think about that? Um, that's an interesting question. I think we could probably get a lot of this. I think we could probably get a lot of the way there, but I think it would be hard to know this for certain. And for sure, I would say phylogenetics alone would not get you there um, because phylogenetics cannot tell us about, you know, did a country just open their borders, just get rid of their restrictions? Was there an outbreak event? You know, did something happen? Now, phylogenetics plus epidemiology kind of more traditional epidemiology, that could maybe get you at least part of the way there because you'd have context for your tree. But I do think that we would still be left a little bit uncertain and that that lab work is a pretty important part of helping us to kind of understand, is there a mechanism here that could be influencing this? But I do think that, you know, for monitoring and coming up with what do we investigate, you know, lab work is great, but it's also intensive. It usually takes a while. It's not cheap usually. So having things that help point us in the direction of, you know, where can we use our lab work most efficiently? I do think phylogenetics and traditional epidemiology can really help us make sure that we're, that we're focusing on the right things in the lab. But I, I think these three all definitely work together. All right, great. Thank you so much. I guess I'm going to pull together some questions on uncertainty from the yeah. audience. Um, how does Nick Strain sample differ from, uh, dif sample different phylotomy uh, resolution and branch durations um, from all the trees presented here, these does not seem to incorporate uncertainty in the polytomy res resolution. 
my concern is that the trees are being presented as definitive without any phylogenetic uncertainty. Have you ever considered to look at the distribution of the trees, particularly for estimating the time to the most recent and common ancestors? Yeah, so a couple of things here. So this is a very good question. The polytomy resolution is done by a program called Tree Time. Um, that's also that's made by Richard Nair, part of the Next Strain team. Um, but it's true that, of course, I mean, there's there's uncertainty in these trees. We build these trees every day, and so they get remade every day. We can't promise that every single tree has every single branch in the same place, but we hope that kind of over time we're getting a good estimate of the general structure of the tree. And actually, with SARS-CoV-2, we can since we literally work with discrete mutations, you know, there hasn't been that many mutations. In a lot of cases, we actually are fairly confident. But I think um, maybe you know to, to really focus in on the question, this is one reason why flipping between the time view and the, the, the divergence view or the mutation view is really important because the mutation view um, can show you where we have these polytomies so that you know we don't have information to separate these out. And we often collapse, all, you can see that the tree really collapses down when you switch from, from, from time view to mutation view because we get rid of a lot of that inferred structure and you end up learning that actually we have no idea, you know, these sequences all just spring out from each other and we can't can't infer much. So it's always important to look at both of those. For the TMRCAs, we do actually show uncertainty. Um, if, if you mouse, or you can actually flick a button and it'll turn on for the whole tree, or you can mouse over a branch and it will pop up with a little confidence estimate for the, the TMRCA. Um, so we are able to give some uncertainty measures there. But it's true that, I mean, if you wanted to have, for whatever reason, for research, a, a definitive, you know, really, really, really accurate, have a lot of, you know, get your bootstrap estimates or your you know, Bayesian tree distributions in there, you would not necessarily want to use our daily builds. You would want to have a much more dedicated process that would probably take longer, but would probably kind of be more accurate. It, you know, may not be current to the day anymore, but that would be what you would want if you wanted to look into these questions really seriously. It, it's always a balance between, you know, speed, accessibility, and, and visualization. We're trying to keep things up to date every day versus, you know, supreme accuracy that takes more time. And there's, there's efforts on both of these in SARS-CoV-2. There's people working on on both ends of that spectrum thankfully yeah and then i guess perhaps just a, a leading question to that like so how does next strain weight the ancestral state reconstruction to account for heterogeneous sampling i don't know if it's somehow you know addressed in a previous um, um well for the for the sampling i mean there's there's only so much that we can do i mean we can yeah. always downsample countries but we can't upsample we can't make sequences yeah. where there aren't any and so it's true i mean we cannot incorporate we cannot really handle this and in particular you know we we can't take into account sometimes if, if a variant is circulating in a country where there's essentially no surveillance going on and then it pops up in another country we'll see this long blank branch you know long branch where we we just have no idea what's happened we have to infer it we know there were a bunch of mutations but yeah we miss a lot of the information there and it's possible in those cases that that the sequence reconstruction may not be completely accurate hopefully if there's enough information kind of on either side sure that blank that branch is always going to be a bit of a blank but hopefully when we get back to something else we'll have other information that can support the deeper ancestral state but yeah i mean sampling bias is is an ongoing problem with SARS-CoV-2 we are not equally represented across Europe or across the world. All right, okay, I guess that also addressed uh, one of the questions that the other audience member has about spatial heterogeneity and um, reporting of sequence for countries with reduced mobility and with others. Um, so um, actually mostly, so Aurelien Norin would like to thank you for your presentation. He would also like to ask, um, by selecting representative sequence in next training versus all sequence available in GS8, isn't there a risk to miss some new variants? For example, media recently shared about the new UK variants with the E484K, 4 4 but they're not indicated in next range just yet. I'm not sure if you could just quickly um, clarify any doubts you might have. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. And essentially, I mean, the answer is, yeah, we're going to miss stuff. If you're sampling 4,000 sequences out of 500,000 sequences, yeah. We're like, this, you know, if, if your whole cluster is, is 2000 sequences, odds are we are not sampling you. So of course we get these by chance, but I think it actually shows the importance of breaking these data sets down. I would say the global next range tree right now, it is not something you would want to be looking at to monitor new variants, for example. It gives you a really great overview of how the virus has changed over time. It gives you a really great, you know, top up, top down view of kind of the global scenario, global travel, big time evolution. 
option. But if you want to be looking into more specific things, you need to take advantage of some of the more specific builds, both that NextRain does on the regional levels, but I think even more so the country level builds, which we have quite a lot. And then if you go to covariance, I actually have dedicated builds for each of these mutations. So for example, there you can zoom right in on trees that focus on a variant or a cluster, and you'll have a much better chance because I've I've upsampled those. And so there's more likely those get picked. And so it is true when we have this much data, figuring out how to divide that down so that you can see, you know, every kind of angle that you want to investigate, it's not a small problem. And it is an indication that, you know, I mean, we're in new territory. We've never had the luxury of this many sequences so quickly. And a lot of our methods that we've relied on previously, we can scale them up, but we don't necessarily have perfect solutions all the time. And I do think at least for the moment, the key is being flexible to having lots of builds maintained by different people so that we can look at this from all different angles and trying to make it so that people can make their own builds so that in case someone else hasn't answered your question, hopefully you can answer it with tools that make that easier. Yeah, so I think he also uh, goes on to ask two more questions. Um, could you ex quickly explain the difference between clades and lineages? And the Pegulin talk about lineage and next strain uses clades. So, I mean, maybe, you know, if you could just help by just sharing a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So just to be very clear, there's not like any official definition of clade or lineage. They're both used pretty loosely, but Nextrain and, and, Pango, and the Pango lineages do use them a little bit more concretely in our bubbles. So the Pango lineage system is more interested in kind of identifying really kind of more detailed parts of the tree. So for example, the Pango lineage might only have kind of a handful of sequences in it. And it's based not only just on the genetics, but also on epi as well. So for example, if a lineage moves from one country to another, it can be classified as a new lineage. Now the Pango lineages are really powerful for looking at things on a really intimate scale. So if you're investigating a local outbreak, for example, you can have a Pango lineage for the sequences that are in your town. And that is obviously super useful if you're on the ground doing kind of public health and intervention things. But the downside is if you wanna talk about a bigger part of the tree, you've got to kind of list like a whole bunch of Pango lineages. And so for that larger scale stuff, it's, it's a little bit more unwieldy. Now from the next year, we're coming at it from the other angle. We're interested in that big picture stuff. So what are the big events in the tree? What are the significant changes and the things that we're really most interested in talking about? How can we group these? And that's why we have kind of fewer names, but they encompass bigger pieces. And so I would say that the reason why actually both of these lineages systems have persisted and that people use both of them is because it kind of depends on what you're doing and what questions you're asking, which is more useful. And, you know, to some extent, people use them interchangeably. They use, they use the next train one for kind of getting you oriented and then they they drill down and give you the pango lineages. So I don't, you know, I think they're, they're complementary and that they're coming at a problem from two different angles and, and they're both useful. It just depends what you're doing. So um, it would be helpful, I would say. I think we all agree it would be nice if we could have like a website. You could could link these up a little bit more easily. But I think that it shows that we, we have two tools to tackle two ends of a problem. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, though I will admit that it is confusing for lay people. Yeah. All right, thanks so much. Um, there's another question from an anonymous uh, attendee. Regarding the EU one, isn't there multiple introductions in the UK actually also attributed to the increased surveillance here with uh, the COG, which I believe is COVID-19 Genomics UK Consortium? Uh, mm -hmm. Most Likely every country has the same general uh, pattern, but most did not have the genomic surveillance or the capability to do so and be able to identify. Yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And you're right. I think we do pick up an increase in the number of introductions because we can actually see it in the UK. If we have go to a country where we have five sequences, well, we're never gonna we're never gonna infer more than five introductions, are we? Um, and so yes, that, that's definitely something to take into account. But I actually think that we we do actually see this differently. So there, you know, no country hits the UK, but we actually do have countries in Europe that have fairly representative random sampling, and we don't have a lot of reason to believe that this doesn't at least somewhat represent what was happening in that country. And I do actually think that in some countries we can see really strikingly the, 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 the many fewer introductions. So for example, in Norway, I think it's actually really striking that essentially, you know, they had one introduction, it took off, they got it under control. And then we can see this kind of trickle in later in the season as they got 
introductions from, from other countries across Europe. We can see the same thing in Iceland and Iceland has really good coverage. And again, we can kind of see similar patterns in Denmark. So sampling definitely plays into it, but I do actually think there were differences in the number of introductions, at least to some degree, you know, orders of magnitude kind of a thing um, is probably the best we can do to estimate that between different countries. But you're right that I think, you know, a lot of countries in Europe had a lot of introductions, but I do think there are, there's kind of a sliding scale there. I'm a little bit more mindful of the time. We are coming at, towards the end of the hour, uh, but maybe just one last question, a really specific one from an audience member. And this person actually read your paper, so I thought that we should just address it. Um, regarding a recent paper um, about the mutation at the 677 codon, how does one go about clustering and identifying the mutations and what do events and entropy denote, denote in the sequence plot in next stream? So let me see. If I can very quickly pull up the 677, let's see if my computer wants to play nice, the 677 tree, I had this open for another talk last night. So kind of to address how we saw the 677 mutations, um, this is not colored by the right thing, but essentially I did a focal build. So I pulled out all of the samples that have this 677 mutation and then I put them in a tree. And so all of the sequences in this tree that are not this turquoise have a mutation at 677. And you can actually start seeing really clearly, I think this is kind of fun because this is what I saw when I, when I opened up this build. And the first thing you can start to see is that there are really distinct kind of chunks in the tree that are not the turquoise blue and that indicate okay, we have a spread of a 677 mutation here. And I started narrowing this down. We were working with a US team. So first I want to just see sequences that have a mutation that are either H or P at that 677 location. So yeah, my computer does not like doing next strain and zoom, but we're going to see if it work anyway. So now we can even more start to see like, you know, these chunky things in the tree, these are spreads of the mutation. And if I filter this again to the USA, we take away a lot of the international, bam, you've got your lineages. This is essentially what started the paper is seeing, oh my gosh, look, we've got these really distinct chunks in the tree. It actually turns out this is two chunks. This is another chunk, but that's how we, that's often how we identify these things. It's not terribly, there's no magic algorithm. It is manual to some degree that when you start looking, you start to see these really distinct patterns that start leading you down a rabbit hole of doing, of course you can't, you know, this is not the end. You have to double check this, make sure that it's reasonable look at it in different views, different trees, et cetera. But this is very often how you start saying, okay, we can see these lineages emerging. We can see them expanding. Why, where, how, when? Let's start and see if we can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Okay, it's actually time to end the seminar. Um, I'm so sorry for those of you who actually ask questions, but we do not have the time to go through all of them. But anyway, uh, thank you, Emma, for agreeing to speak again today. It was really great to hear about your work. Um, thank you for being able to join us, the rest of you. And I guess this is the end of the seminar. Goodbye. And it's a pleasure having all of you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everyone, for the fantastic questions. I hope you enjoyed it. And it was a pleasure to be here. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.